3D echocardiography, it's definitely a hot topic. But why do we actually try to image the heart in 3D in the first place? And how did we get to where we are today? Well, this is actually the true reason why there is something like 3D echocardiography, gynecology, and prenatal ultrasound, which was able to generate images like this. Now, isn't this fascinating to look at the different facial expressions of the fetus? Well, this really sparked the interest in using 3D in other modalities as well. But before I go on, let me just mention that an Austrian company was strongly involved actually in the beginnings of 3D ultrasound and probably also 3D echocardiography. Paul Kretz was the founder of the Kretz company, and in 1989, they released the scanner called Combison 330, which generated the first 3D images at that time of fetus. Of course, they developed much more over the time, and then they were finally acquired by a Korean company called Medison, which was then acquired by General Electric. So you see, even in modern scanners, you've got a lot of the technology or actually uh, developments included that were of course, pioneered by Paul Kretz in the early years. Of course, at that time, there were also developments in creating 3D images of the heart, which was a little bit more difficult because the heart moves. So it's, of course, much more difficult to acquire so many uh, images in such a short time. But the first work that was done was in creating so-called wireframes. Here you would kind of integrate several views into a 3D data set and then generate, as in this example, a crude reconstruction of the left ventricle. Now, this got better and better and more and more refined, uh, but it still wasn't good enough to really look at structures of the heart. The next step was to generate special transducers that were able to acquire 3D data sets. First, they used position localizers, then later on, special motors that would advance the probe in a certain direction. And then what was created was a so-called TECT probe, or we also called it lobster tail probe, which had the advantage that you would acquire parallel images while the transducer was moved along an encasing which was placed in the esophagus. I still remember we used this probe and it was kind of, um, a very thick probe, patients often had problems to swallow them, but the image quality we got was actually fantastic and not much worse than what we get today it was the only difference that it sometimes took um, days to really reconstruct them. So you would start the reconstruction process in the evening and you know at the end of the next day you would finally get a good reconstruction, for example, of the mitral valve. Anyway, this was just the beginning of 3D echocardiography and Certainly, we've really moved a long way from these early days. The next big step in development was that of so-called matrix array probes, which allowed you to acquire an entire pyramidal volume and thereby a complete data set with basically a few heartbeats. And this opened actually the window to perform live 3D imaging. In other words, you could see the 3D image immediately while you were imaging. The scanners at that time, of course, were huge. There was a lot of processing power that was necessary. Imagine you have to create uh, hundreds of pyramidal volumes within you know, a short period of time. And this, of course, was a technical challenge. And the images we got weren't so bad, actually. Of course, they were far below what you could achieve with a normal 2D image. But it allowed us, for example, to quantify uh, the area in mitral stenosis and we performed a study at that time with such a system uh, was very fascinating but the machines were too big they were too impractical and at that time they did not really have any big clinical penetration with the advances in computer technology and miniaturization it was now possible to create transducers with a smaller footprint and move a lot of the processing into the transducer thereby the frame rates increased the image quality increased, and basically uh, we got to a point where we can now really think of using 3D in daily clinical practice. Of course, such transducers were also developed for the TE approach, and I'll show you images later that demonstrate the fantastic quality of structures that we can visualize with 3D, such as the mitral valve later on. What is the fascinating thing about 3D images in the first place? Why do we want to see them? It's a very simple answer because our world is 3D, 
and that's how we're used to perceiving our environment. So we obviously try to strive for 3D images, but be aware that if we look at a 3D image on a flat screen, it's not really 3D. We're just tricked into believing it is 3D. So there is a little bit of manipulation you have to understand. Now, there are modern monitors that are now being tested where you really see a 3D image, where you don't even need a glass, a 3D glasses or anything else. But um, again, this is something that is still very expensive, but I believe that this is something that will come in the future. At this time, uh, the best we have at hand is um, uh, the typical 3D image that you probably know from the 3D cinemas where you put on these glasses and where you get a special image that looks like this. And with the 3D glass, you can see the depth and of course the spatial uh, impression of structures as the mitral valve here. So to give us the impression that something is truly 3D on a flat screen, different shading techniques and lighting techniques are used. We try to, for example, display structures which are closer to us, the observer, in a lighter shade opposed to something who is farther away, or vice versa, depending on the shading technique that is used. And of course, we also use shadowing, and we try to calculate from which direction the light hits the surface and how it would bounce off. And that allows us to reconstruct structures like this, where you can even detect fine structures such as hairs and uh, make them look very, very realistic. Of course, this has been done with medical images in many other areas as well. This is an MRI study that shows you how well we could actually reconstruct a crocodile or an alligator. But be aware that if we use all of these techniques, we're prone to being, uh, I would say, tricked into thinking that things look as they actually don't look. And this is the classic optical illusion that many of you have probably seen before. It's this fisherman where you would probably be happy if you would catch such a large fish. But when you look at this image here, you see that obviously it's just a matter of distance and how something is being portrayed on a screen. So be aware that very similar mechanisms that trick us also occur in medical imaging and also in 3D imaging. Still, if we use 3D echocardiography, especially live 3D, we can get very fascinating structures which give us a better impression of the true, I would say, topography and relationship of structures to each other and dimensions. Here is such an image of the left ventricle and the mitral valve. You can nicely see the mitral valve moving right here inside the ventricle here. And you can, of course, look at all sorts of structures. For example, the aortic valve, very nicely seen here. 3D echocardiography usually works well when you are looking from a cavity to a structure. So you need kind of a space from where you're looking towards a structure. We get beautiful images also of prosthetic structures. Here is, as you will easily determine, a bileaflet mechanical valve of the mitral valve. You can see the occluders opening and closing. So these are very, very fascinating structures. And I don't think any of you would pick up, for example, the sutures here around the ring without the help of 3D echocardiography. So definitely we get a better appreciation for certain structures, but not always, as you will see later. When you acquire a 3D data set, there's basically two ways of doing it. One way of doing it would be that you acquire a total data set within one beat, or you image it live, in other words, in the sense of a live 3D imaging. But if you want to get higher quality images, what you would need to do is you need to use the so-called triggered multi-beat acquisition. What is that? Well, it's a technique where you kind of stitch different regions of the image together, because then you can use a higher line density. While the triggered multi-beat acquisition has a very good temporal and spatial resolution, it also has a number of drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks is that you have to stitch the different volumes to each other. So the patient really has to be very still. You have to perform that under a breath hold uh, situation. And it can be challenging to really hold the transducer steady. Still, it's a methodology where you usually get very, very good images if you perform it correctly. The method that is now used more and more and where I think the trend will 
definitely go is real-time 3D because this is the easy approach. You simply put the transducer on the chest and you get the live 3D image while you're imaging, which has a number of advantages. You don't need to do any post-processing. You see what you want to see instantly. However, at this time, of course, you can only use it within narrow sectors. You can use it in zoomed views. And um, the frame rate is not as high as it would use, for example, the multi-beat technology. Still, I think with increases in processing power, I'm sure that this will be the technology that will be most widely used. And we already use it, for example, to monitor procedures. Here is a beautiful example of a patient who has mitral stenosis. You see the mitral opening area here very nicely. This is the left ventricle outflow tract. So, of course, you always have 2D reference images which help you to understand the 3D image as well. One of the newer advances is that we're now also using 3D color, which we overlay on to the 3D normal image. And that allows us to, for example, look at the origin of jets. A patient with mitral regurgitation, this is the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet, and very nicely we can display the origin of the jet. Now, of course, one of the disadvantages of color Doppler 3D is that the resolution, again, is not as high as we would wish it to be. Still, with one advance towards the next, uh, this is also improving, and I think it's only a matter of time until processing uh, capabilities are high enough to really yield this clinically valuable. And then there's another way of displaying the image, the so-called multiplane imaging format. The way this works is very simple. You're using the 3D data set, but you're only displaying orthogonal planes. In other words, the four-chamber view, the two-chamber view, and an apical long axis view simultaneously. This is a nice way of actually saving time. You put the transducer on the apex and you already get all three views. And it's also a very good modality that helps you to perform stress echocardiography because immediately you can acquire all three images. Now, uh, is this something that we use very frequently? Off and on we do, uh, but we still probably prefer to use a 2D imaging probe and just rotate it. But I guess it's a matter of preference and it's also a matter of how quick you are in adjusting the image planes. But where this technology certainly has its role is if you, for example, want to perform um, further analysis. For example, if you want to look at a color jet simultaneously in three uh, dimensions, or if you want to perform, for example, a 3D speckle tracking uh, analysis, uh, in this situation, uh, you can get uh, fascinating images that allows you to use this technology, for example, even in patients who have atrial fibrillation. Here's another example of such a multi-slice, nine-plane simultaneous visualization of the left ventricle. And if you want to be creative, you can, of course, combine this technology with other modalities, such as contrast. And then you can even see a contrast study in 3D. So there's a lot of opportunities that you have, and we'll have to see which of these will eventually prevail. Of course, multi-slice also lends itself to the assessment of color Doppler. Now here you can, again, study a jet, you study the origin of the jet at different levels, all of these things which are technically feasible, but uh, which not really have been validated in large studies so far. But I think if you have these things at hand, it's always nice to play around with them so that you get a better feel. And uh, there's always a little bit of um, different laboratories using different modalities when it comes to 3D imaging. But one thing that is also very important and often forgotten is that you have different ways of displaying 3D structures to give you this impression of spatial representation. And uh, the way you can color them uh, is something you can adjust in your machine. And here are different ways of reconstructing the images. Depends, of course, on your preference. When you acquire your first 3D images, it might be a little bit confusing at the beginning and you will need some technical support, but there are some general rules no matter which vendor you're using. One of these rules is that you should narrow your field of interest uh, to the region you really want to image. Thereby, you have a better spatial and also temporal resolution. And this is done, for example, in this patient here where we really want to focus on the mitral valve. So this is the region that we're going to reconstruct. We don't care about anything else. And uh, one thing that some of the vendors uh, also allow you to do is you, they allow you to look at uh, the 
reconstructed structure from several views. And you also have the chance of determining from where you want to look at the structure. And one of these functions is so-called dart function, where you kind of draw an arrow from where you want to look towards the structure. Here's an example of a TE study where you're looking from the left atrium to the mitral valve, actually right at this suspicious structure here on the anterior leaflet. Here in the 3D image, it's nice to appreciate that this is actually a vegetation which is on the mitral valve. Now, the additional benefit of 3D is that you can see the entire mitral valve. You can see the relationship of the leaflets to each other. And in this case, what we didn't appreciate in the 2D image was that there is a second vegetation here in the commissural region. So um, just up front, a few examples of where 3D does have its edge. To summarize and to review some of the very important factors that you need to consider when you perform 3D echocardiography. First of all, 3D image quality is always less than the 2D image quality. Second, the transducers are still a little bit larger than the conventional 2D image transducers. In other words, the footprint will be larger. You have to use breath hold if you use the multi-beat approach because you're going to stitch. You have a smaller sept a sector available you cannot usually open the sector as wide as you would like to. And finally, if you have arrhythmias, especially if you're using the gated technology, it can be difficult to get good images. Therefore, in this case, you probably would uh, prefer to use either a single beat acquisition or live 3D scanning. So you see, acquiring images and performing 3D echocardiography is not so difficult. And I guess if you play around with it a little bit and if you have someone to guide your hand at the beginning, you'll get very nice images very early on. In the next chapter, we're gonna to move to the clinical applications of 3D and I'm gonna show you where it makes sense to perform 3D echocardiography.